All right, so I have an interesting message today. Um, it's not part of the simple series. Um, I didn't plan to just kind of stop the simple series. I was honestly about halfway in this message, and I said, you know what, this really isn't going in the direction of the simple series, and so it took a completely different direction, so I'm, I'm kind of excited about that. Are we finished with the simple series? I don't know, okay? Um, but we'll, we'll get there. I will warn you... At times, a little bit later on, it is a little bit PG-13, just, just fair warning. Um, and uh, if, you, if you're worried about that, I will be as gracious as I possibly can. I promise you it's really nothing more than they see on TV pretty much every day. Um, but we will be very, very gracious with it. Or if you'd like, you can take them into the back to kids' church back there. So um, my title for today is Caught in the Act. Caught in the act, and it's we're going to John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Now, technically, we're going to jump over to John chapter 7, at the very, very end of that chapter, there's like half of a sentence in chapter 7. So if you want to go ahead and flip there, um, but I want to kind of catch you up on what's happening here in this story. So Jesus is going around, uh, all around Israel, and particularly at this time, he's in Jerusalem. And he's in the temple preaching and teaching. And that's what Jesus did when he came from the north in Galilee. He would come down south to Jerusalem. Uh, and he, he was there for the festival of tabernacles. Uh, and then he would go into the temple or the temple courts and he would preach and teach. And Jesus was getting this really big following because he was doing miracles. He taught as one that had authority, scripture says. And so like people are like, this guy might really be the real thing. He's probably not just a prophet. He, this guy might be the Messiah. So all these people are following him. And all along the way, he's kind of bumping heads with the scribes and the Pharisees and all the religious leaders of the day. And they don't like him. They're trying to figure out a way to get rid of him. And in fact, they're trying to find a way to kill him. And so all of that's kind of going on, and every time Jesus preaches and teaches, he gains more and more followers and kind of more of a presence in there, and the, the Pharisees and the scribes, they did not like that. Now, real quick, before we jump into the text, I want to clarify something. So if you've been around the Bible for a while, there are some places in Scripture, now, now this is really important to hear, there's some parts in Scripture that are not written in all of the ancient manuscripts, okay? We have some little uh, ending of chapters and places and stuff, and it's, it's not in every translation or every manuscript. And, and I want to speak into that. And this story here that we're going to read today is one of those stories. Um, I, I usually go from the NIV Bible, and if you look in the NIV, it's italicized, so that gives us an indication that, hey, this, this, there, there's something here, so we have to dig into it. So um, I'll tell you, this particular story here, verses 1 through 11, it does not appear in even, even, I won't say all, but even many of the ancient manuscripts. And so be careful at jumping all over that, because you would go, uh, see, I, see, I've got a problem with that. Well, we don't have the original writings anyway, so what we have are manuscripts, and, and it was copied, and it was copied, and it was copied over thousands of years till we are now. And at first glance, and again, I want to caution you, at first glance, you know that game Telephone, to where you, you whisper something in someone's ear, and then it goes from this person, this person, and when it gets like 10 people away, it's completely different from how it started. See, a lot of people think that's how the Bible is. Well, see, the Bible, it, it can't be trusted. It's not accurate because it's just been copied and copied and copied, and there's so mistakes in it. Except for the fact that we can compare what we have today, this book right here, and go back to the very ancient manuscripts, the very first ones that we have. And by the way, we have thousands and thousands of copies of ancient manuscripts and texts. And it is exactly to the T, maybe some grammatical changes. Like, like when I was in school, we were taught to never put a comma in front of and in a list, and now they're teaching put a, that drives me nuts, okay? Um, I want to fix it every time I see it. But, but kind of like those things, okay, maybe, maybe we would find some grammatical changes, 
but this is exactly what we would find in the ancient manuscripts. So don't ever let anybody tell you, oh, the Bible can't be trusted. This has been copied and copied over and over, and it's changed along the way. That is factually untrue. All right, so, but in, in all honesty, this text that we're going to read today and, and treat after as it is part of scripture. Um, it doesn't appear in many of the ancient manuscripts. Um, and even some manuscripts enter it into different places. It's not necessarily John chapter eight. And by the way, when they wrote this, they didn't write, okay, John chapter eight and John's writing. Here's chapter eight, here's chapter nine. It, that came much later, okay? Um, and then a lot of other people have a problem with this passage because when you read it, it could be misinterpreted that Jesus was kind of downplaying and excusing sexual immorality. Now, we know that is not the case because we see it all throughout. So, so those are kind of um, people that would argue against this passage. That's what they would say. Now, here's, here's some of the rebuttals. Um, early Christian writers mention this account, like, like from 100 AD or so, I don't know exactly when, but like, like in, the, in the hundreds, like these would have been guys that would have been with Peter and John or Paul or maybe right after them that wrote and spoke about this story, okay? So there's one little bit of evidence, um, and uh, because it's in different locations in some of the manuscripts, I was... I, I, I went on a, a geek deep dive into this. Uh, one person wrote it like this. The scribes were, and the people that were writing down and copying the manuscripts, the scribes were, quote, anxious to retain it as a part of the four gospels. They didn't really know where exactly it fit in, kind of chronologically, but they knew it needed to be there. So they tried to insert it where they thought was best. Um, and then the last one that we said, um, scripture is packed packed with condemnation of sexual immorality. So there's obviously no downplaying of sexual sin in this passage. So I wanted to give you kind of both sides of the coin on this passage. I fully believe that this, is ha that this happened. And, and let's be honest, this story fits very well with Jesus' character. If, if it were like showed Jesus in a completely different light and he treated somebody else completely differently, I would really have my hesitations at this. But there's, I won't say a parallel passage, but there is another passage that we know of where Jesus encounters a woman uh, at the well. And he basically treats her the, the very same way with this love, grace, and compassion, but very much the 100% truth. And so... That's how we see Jesus. So do I believe that this passage fits into Scripture? Absolutely, 100%. So John chapter 7, the end of verse 53, the end of that chapter, here we go. It says, then they all went home. Now, they all are the people that were there listening to Jesus preach and teach in the temple and in the temple courts right there. So it gets to the end of the day. They all go home. Now, chapter 8, verse 1, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, if you're in Jerusalem, Jerusalem is up here on the hill, and, and you can see pictures of it, and you would look down the Kidron Valley, and then right up, right across from Jerusalem is the Mount of Olives, and, and right down there, there's still now this section that they call the Garden of Gethsemane. It wasn't a garden like flowers, it was just an olive grove, and so that's why they call it the Mount of Olives. And oftentimes, it says Jesus would go out there to pray, but also we know Jesus would go, if it was towards the end of the day and he knew he was coming back right the next morning, he would go just sleep on the Mount of Olives. Now, oftentimes he would go to a close town called Bethany because we know he knew some people that lived there. Who was that? Who lived in Bethany? Lazarus, Mary, Martha, remember? So we talked about that not too long ago, that Jesus would go stay at their house, but he knew if it was just gonna be a quick turnaround and first thing in the morning he was gonna be back teaching, he would go actually sleep on the Mount of Olives. Remember that story when the guy approached Jesus and he's like, Jesus, I, you know, I wanna follow you, you know? And he's like, that's great, but foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. That's that thing. That's him going up to stay on the Mount of Olives. All right. Now, it says, verse 2, 
at dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts. Now, this tells us right here that Jesus was an early riser. How many of my early risers are out here? That's me. I got my hand up. Okay, all of you sleeper inners. We're like Jesus. I'm, I'm just saying, okay? Just kidding. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. Now, I want to draw something else out from here. Back then, the teacher would sit down and the crowd or the congregation would stand. How do you feel about that? Don't, listen, if I had to sit down during this, I would totally freak out. I, don't, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. So, but that's how they would do it. He would sit down. They would stand and listen. Now, I want to I pause our story for a second, okay, because I, I really, really want to explain this. This is a potentially difficult passage, and it's a potentially difficult message, I, I was going around greeting some people before service, and they said, hey, we're, we're looking forward to you know, hearing what you say. And I said, great, me too, because I, I know this, this could possibly rub you in the wrong way. Um, I would go as far as to say that it might offend some of you. Okay, so I, I, I just, I, I'm always a guy that wants to just lay it all out right there just, just so you know this might be a little bit tough to swallow at times, all right? But th there's two things that I really felt the more I studied this passage, the more I wanted to drill down here. Number one, um, the elders and I just recently have discussed zeroing in on some specific topics and things that are just uber applicable to our lives, um, very applicable to what we see in culture today as to what is accepted in culture, um, and then also zeroing in on some things that... Um, I don't know if you know this, maybe you've turned on the TV, but we're kind of in an election season Okay, and so maybe some things that are culturally relevant to that. Now, I promise you, I will not get political from this stage. I will speak what Scripture says, okay? So, so that's, I just want to lay that all out there. So in the, in the coming weeks and months, you're going to see some messages and, and some teachings on our different outlets that are maybe a little more zeroed in on some specific topics. You guys know a while back I did a whole series called Tough Topics, okay? So we may kind of hone in on some of those things. So that's the first thing. Um, the second reason why I want to be up here and teach a potentially difficult passage is that I have made a commitment to God as well as a promise to you that I will never Please, Lord, I will never shy away from teaching and preaching what I feel like God has laid on my heart. Not necessarily my personal, uh, my personal conviction necessarily, but for what I feel like God has put before us here. I promise you and I promise God I will not shy away from that. Even at the possibility of offending you in a way that you will leave. And, and I say that with as much love and humility and kindness and grace as possible. But the moment that I start to shy away from what God's word says, I am doing you a disservice. Is it going to rub some people wrong sometimes? Yes, it's going to. Guess what? It, it, it says the gospel is offensive. It is going to hit your button None of us like our buttons hit, but it's going to hit your button one time or another. So as Christians, we often, because um, we, we don't want to offend people, right? We use that as an excuse to not share our faith. Well, I don't want to offend them. And I believe we often not offend people right into hell. And I don't ever, ever want to do that. I want to give you the truth of God's word. Now, I want to make you guys a pinky promise, okay? You guys, will you make a pinky promise with me? I won't make you put your fingers up in the air like that. That would be weird, okay? But, okay, I promise 
that I will always, to the best of my ability, now I'm going to mess up, I'm going to say human things, I'm going to think that I'm being sensitive in some areas and not, I, I did it just a few weeks ago where I had to come up the next week and say, I, I said it this way, here's how I meant it, but I really, I, I want you, to, okay, I, I'm going to do that because I'm human and I'm going to mess up. But I, I promise I will always, to the best of my ability, bring you the biblical truth that I feel like God is revealing on my heart. If, if I offend you in any way that you will come to me first. Is that a deal? Like, like I, I get it. I, I, I'm, I, again, I'm human. I'm probably going to offend you, and God's word is going to offend you. And I want to ask you, before you just up and leave, before you post something on social media, before you go talk to all your friends, maybe you go talk to a spouse or a trusted person, but before you just leave or just get mad, will you please come to me? If you promise to do that, I promise I will bring you the truth every single time I stand here at this pulpit. Is that a deal? Yeah. Peaky promise? All right, cool. Let's move on. That's enough of that. Verse 3. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now, I don't want to read into this too much, but it seems like the way that it was originally written, and, and I'll be cautious here, that like caught in the act means really caught during the act. That's kind of what this passage is alluding to. Also, we can kind of allude to the fact that this was a setup. This was very much a setup because we're going to see here in a minute, they didn't really care about the law. They cared about getting Jesus, about proving him wrong. So, also, again, not to paint too much of a picture here, but I want you to understand, like, they drag this woman into the temple courts in front of Jesus, in front of this crowd, probably just caught in the act. And I'll say it this way, she probably wasn't properly dressed. I, I, I want you to see the severity of what's happening and the shame and the guilt that this woman would have felt in this moment. So... Verse 5, they go on, they say, In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? Now, we have two problems here. The first problem is stoning was used in the wilderness. Remember last week we were in the wilderness and Moses and the Exodus and all that? That was like a thousand years ago. They didn't use stoning any longer, and they're trying to bring up this old law. So that, that, that obviously this shows that's not really what they were concerned with. So number one, stoning was used in the wilderness a thousand years. Number two, they were one-sidedly misquoting a law. Let me read to you what it actually says in here. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, it says, If a man commits adultery with another man's wife, with the wife of his neighbor, here it is, both the adulterer and the adulteress, uh, the adulteress are to be put to death. Question, where's the dude? He's nowhere to be found, is he? Quite possibly part of the setup. Again, this wasn't about law. This wasn't about right and wrong. This was about getting Jesus. Verse 6, and it says it right here. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. You talk about a boss move here. The religious leaders, I mean, the guys that had all of the power, except for the Romans, come and make this horrendous accusation against this woman, and Jesus completely ignores him, just bends down, and starts to write. It would have been dirt, and he was writing something. 
They're going off. They're dragging her. She's probably crying. She, like all, can you just, I want you to picture everything that's going and this crowd of people. I mean, you, can you imagine the silence of the crowd at that moment? Jesus, just riding in the dirt. Now, here's something interesting. This is the only time in Scripture where it says that Jesus wrote anything. That's just a freebie. doesn't have anything to do with the message. But Now, I guess really a question is, what was he writing? Anybody know? You don't, because it doesn't say it. What a lot of people think he was writing, and we don't really have any basis for this, but it's very possible that he was writing their names, these accusers, and he would write their name, and he would write their sin. And he'd go to the next one and write their name, and he would write their sin. And these, like, like not just, oh, you messed up the other day, like, there are things that they were really, really convicted on. Verse 7, it says, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who was without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus flips the script from a legal issue to a spiritual issue. Jesus was so good at that. He's like, guys, you're not fooling me. I know what you're trying to do. So let's, let's just look at your hearts here for a minute is what Jesus is doing. Now, when it says, he who is without sin, it's a really, really cool word. I kind of geeked out on this this week as well. That word without sin is anamartetos. Everybody say anamartetos. See, now you learned Greek today. Anamartetos means sinless. Okay, so that's right there in the passage. But it also means both one who has not sinned and one who cannot sin. So that really changes that. Not like, hey, anybody that's been really good recently, you go ahead and you throw the first stone. Jesus says, no, 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 no. Any of you who are without sin and then also you are never going to sin, you go ahead. You throw the first stone. I'll wait. Now, Jesus knew there was no one else in the midst except for him. He's like, listen, listen. And if anybody, just, just if, if you guys fall into that qualification without sin, you go ahead. You, you, yeah, yeah, you go ahead. Nothing. Nothing. Here's something else. Self-righteousness almost always ends up in self-condemnation. That'll preach, right? I mean, I could write a whole message on that. So when we are self-righteous... When we try to put ourselves forward or, or think about how good we are, pretty much always ends up in self-condemnation. And that's what happened with these guys right here. So Jesus stands up. He says that one line, if you're without sin, go ahead, throw a stone at her. Verse 8, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Now go and leave your life of sin. If anyone ever had the right, the authority, this, just the ability to condemn her right there in that spot, it would have been Jesus. And oh, by the way, how can you say that, Trevor? Because I can say very shortly after Jesus hung on a cross because of that sin right there. So if anyone could condemn her, it was the guy that would be hanging on the cross for the act that she was just caught in. And he did not condemn her. He was very truthful with her and said, go and leave your life of sin. But he did not condemn her. So that's the story. But we're not done. I want us to pull a little bit of application here. 
That's great. It's a good story. Love Jesus. He's like my, my guy. My, like, okay, all of that. That's awesome. I love great biblical stories. But it's really when we dig in and we say, hey, what can I do with this? How can I learn from this in a way that it's going to change me and change the way that I see other people? That's what we have to dig into with Scripture. So I've got three questions that we are going to answer, and we are done. Are you guys ready? Okay. Hold on to your hats. Buckle your safety belts. Keep all arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Okay? Here we go. Number one, how do we respond to people, quote, unquote, caught in sin? Okay? So that's Jesus. That's the Pharisees. That's all the, these people. They, they, they have this lady red-handed. How do we respond as followers of Jesus, as the church, or just people in general? How do we respond to people caught in sin? Well, here's one way. How about just like the God that we say that we follow did? That'd probably be a good starting point, right? Right? Um, Help me out with that verse. It's kind of fuzzy. For God so loved the world... Are there any exceptions in there? Nope. It's just the world. I'd probably put exceptions in there. For Trevor so loved all the people that are nice to him. You know, all the people that could do something for him. Or you know, Nope, but it's a good thing I didn't get to write the Bible, right? That was, that was a great spot for an amen. Okay, you missed it. It's too late now. It's too late. Okay. God so loved the world so should we. See, here's the thing, and here's, here's where we get this messed up, as, especially as the church. The church, not necessarily Island Community Church, but the big capital C church, Christians, have not always done a great job at this, have we? Because, like, God loves drug addicts, but not addiction, God loves liars, but not lying. He loves adulterers, not adultery. And he even loves homosexuals, but not homosexuality. And see, again, the church has done oftentimes a terrible, terrible job at this. And by the way, it's a, it's a big argument out there, oh, the Bible doesn't really mention homosexuality or that it's wrong, actually seven times, which is really interesting that it's that number, seven times Scripture mentions homosexuality. Not that we're talking about that that today necessarily, but yes, Jesus does love everyone, no exceptions. So how do we respond to people caught in sin? Here it is, with love grace, dignity because of that shame that they're probably feeling, acceptance. Now, if you hear anything that we say today, this one might be it. Acceptance of the person, not the practice, because that's a big thing now. Well, that's just me, and you have to accept that part of me, that sin. Wrong. No. We accept people. We don't accept the practice. So love, grace, dignity, acceptance of the person, and, here's the big part, and the unashamed truth of God's word. See, that's not an either or, that's a both and. Love, grace, acceptance, hey, God loves you. I, let's walk through this together. Like, it's okay. I know you have made mistakes. I have made mistakes. It's okay. But here's what God's word says about this. And you give them what we talk about pretty much every single week, right? Like, like, hey, God has a plan for you. God has an awesome plan for you. It's not this. This is not God's plan for you. This sin, whatever it is. God has such a better plan in a way that it will bring you joy. It will bring you peace. You'll be able to sleep at night. You'll be able to live with yourself if you just follow God's plan. 
And we watch people all the time search and search and search for that thing that will make them happy. And they never find it. So yeah, do we give them love and grace and dignity and acceptance and all of those things? Absolutely. And we go to them with with God's truth and say, God has a better plan than what you are living right now. Back to verse 10, it says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And by the way, when he says woman, that is not a term of disrespect. It it would kind of be disrespectful in our day. It was a term of respect back then. Okay, and we see it a few different times. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Can you imagine how her voice probably quivered when she said that? When she was just figuring out what was probably going to happen, how, just, just how sheepish her voice would have been at that time. No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. See, this is really important for us to understand. He was saying, stop living this way. What he didn't say was, stop doing this thing. Jesus was saying, stop this lifestyle that you are living, this lifestyle that has become a part of you. Not just, oh, she was doing something wrong. He was saying, you have to change that part of you. So how do we respond to people caught in sin with love, grace, dignity, acceptance, and the unashamed truth of God's word? Number two. It gets more fun as we go. How do we respond if we are caught in sin? You're like, oh man, I was hoping he wouldn't go there. Yep, we're going there. Right, now, here's where we really have to understand. There's a huge difference of sinning and being repentant and sorrowful. And oh, it's, it's like, oh, I did that thing again. Oh, I'm so, I'm sorry, God. I'm, I'm trying. God, please help me. I did that thing. I, that, that word came out of my mouth. I, I, I yelled at my loved ones again. I, I, I just, I cut people off in traffic. And, and, and I, I know people on the road are just, probably shouldn't use that word in church. Okay, but they're bad people, okay? And we want to cut them off and we want to do bad things to them and give them the international peace sign. And I did that thing again and I shouldn't do that, right? Okay. There is a massive difference between that and when you sin and you, you just, oh, God, I need your help in that. That's one thing. The other side of it is accepting your sin as just, well, this is just part of me. I've always done it this way. I, I, I can't stop doing that thing or or listen those rules really more applied when i was younger but they don't i mean listen i'm older i I can make my own choices now it's working for me or or do you know how inconvenient it would be if i stopped doing that do you know what it would cost me if i stopped doing that what what are all those things i just said excuses they're all excuses and so when there is such difference in messing up and being truly repentant, not, not, not the five-year-old, I'm sorry that I got caught. Okay, don't do that. God obviously sees right through that. But when you are truly sorrowful for what you're doing or you're just choosing this sin because, well, it's just part of you now. Okay, we're talking about the difference between those two things, Okay. So how do you respond if we are caught in sin? I'm talking about that aha moment where you go, yeah, yeah, I, I probably need to change that. Yeah, you know what, I've, 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 I've suppressed that down inside of me for so long, like, but I, I know it's wrong. I know I shouldn't be living like this. I, I just, I know I need to change it. How do we respond to that? scripture, there are several different lists of different sins. 
And a lot of these times we go to these lists to find the, the big sins, right? If, that, if that's even really a thing, you know, right? And the ones that oftentimes, again, Christians have really clung to those certain sins. I hate that, by the way. But oftentimes what, what some Christians neglect to see is that in those lists are also some things that mm, we probably do on a regular basis. One of those lists is 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And it starts in verse 9 here, and Paul is just kind of going off on them and like on this church and these believers and going, guys, don't you realize you're hurting your witness as believers? You're, You're just killing us. What are you doing? So he says this, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Which, pause right there. We all should be freaking out at that verse right there. You don't have to raise your hand, but I don't know that there's any of us in this room that isn't a wrongdoer, right? Are we all are we all wrongdoers in this room? My mic doesn't like it right there. We all are. And it says, all wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. We've got a problem. We've got a huge problem here. So it goes on, do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy. Whoa, how did greedy make this list? Like, we were talking about bad things. I mean, I'm a, I, I mean I, aren't we all a little bit greedy at times? Okay, nor drunkards. Oh, wait a minute. If I'm getting drunk, that, uh, nor slanderers, if you talk smack about somebody, nor swindlers, if you're you know, trying to cheat people out of things, none of them will inherit the kingdom of God. We got a problem. We've got a big problem, don't we? Because I have a feeling that that's not the extent of the list. I don't think the point of this list is really speaking about individual sins. I think here's what it's getting at. Notice that when it's talking about things, It's describing the identity of the people, not the individual sins that they're wrapped up in. It's not saying, hey, if you've ever been greedy before, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. You won't go to heaven. If you've ever been drunk before, you're not going to go to heaven. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, if this is your lifestyle, if this is what you are choosing, we got a problem. We've got a massive problem if this is the thing that could categorize your life. Paul would say, we have got a huge problem here. There is a massive difference between committing a sin versus allowing sin to become your identity. There is a huge difference. Guess what? We're all sinners, aren't we? Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in big trouble. Thankfully, we have a Savior. He's calling right now. He's working on your hearts as we speak. Sorry. All right. Such a difference when we just sin or we just allow that sin to become a part of us an accepted part of us. And I think that's what Paul is getting at here. I think when we allow sin to become our identity or this this common unrepentant practice in our lives, we're choosing sin over choosing to completely and wholeheartedly follow Jesus. Jesus. See, when when that sin is our identity, we are allowing our sin to be more important than our relationship with Jesus. And I want to say this as carefully as possible. When I read scripture, I don't see a whole lot of wiggle room here. Because I don't take acceptance of Jesus as my Savior as a light thing. It's not just a prayer. It's not just church attendance. It's not just becoming a better person. It is giving Jesus control of your life in a way that you say, Jesus, you're my Savior. 
You're my master. You are Lord of my life. That means master. So God, you are now in charge, not me. And when we are taking that authority away from God and we are allowing our sin to be a focal point in our life, then Jesus doesn't have our entire life, does he? And I'm not trying to stand up here and tell you where that fine line in the sand is. I'm not trying to challenge anyone's salvation. That's not the point of this today. What I am saying is this is very, very dangerous ground. When you allow sin to just be okay, sin has become your master and not fully Jesus. You have not wholeheartedly allowed Jesus to be the savior of your life. Remember that, that passage, yes, Jesus is talking about money, and, he, and, and um, he says, you know, you can't serve God and money. You, 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 you can't have two things. You can't have two masters. You'll, you'll hate one, and you'll love the other. You'll despise one, and you'll cling to the other. Like, like it just doesn't work. Back to verse 10, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So boom, we've got a problem. Verse 11, and that is what some of you, and here's one of the best words in scripture. What's that next word? Were. That's what some of you were. You don't have to be that anymore. Notice it doesn't say that's what some of you did you didn't, we all have done many of those things, but that had become those people's identity over being a follower of Jesus. And probably one of the very, very best words in scripture is that first word of that next sentence, but, but you were washed You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now, I don't have time to break down those three words, washed, sanctified, justified. I'll just put it this way. Those are churchy words, okay, with really big meanings, but basically it means you're allowing Jesus to overhaul your life, not sprinkle some Jesus into your life and hope it works out. It means Jesus is allowed to come in and wreck shop and do something new in you that's never been done before. Only Jesus does that. Not getting better, not trying harder. It doesn't work. Only Jesus, as we just sang. So how do we respond if we are caught in sin? By realizing, or we respond by realizing that wholeheartedly following Jesus is better than any sin or lifestyle we could choose. Following Jesus is better than anything that we could possibly choose. So we answered the first question, how do we respond to people caught in sin? We answered, how do we respond if we are caught in sin? And I want to ask the band to come forward before I get into this last one here. How do we prevent falling into sin? I think this is a good place to land because, uh, again, we've, we've, we've hit some areas, but if I don't give you some tools or some handles to say, hey, I don't ever want to go there. I don't ever want to be caught in a place where I don't have the control or, or, or just uh, I don't know what to do. How do you prevent falling into sin? I've got four simple things. I made them really, really easy to remember. Number one, choose the Savior over sin. Choose Jesus Christ over your sin. Whatever sin is in your life, whatever thing has taken precedence, and and you may be a, a great person compared to the person sitting next to you, but there might just be some area in your life that you have chosen to just ignore, suppress, justify, make excuses for. I promise you, the Savior is better. So number one, choose the Savior over sin. Number two, choose obedience over offenses. You know that old saying, ignorance of the law is no excuse. 
if you're not constantly digging into God's word and saying, hey, God, I need you to speak to me. Like, I, I, I just continuously mess up. God, I, I need you to show me how it is that you want me to live. If you're not doing that regularly, guess what's going to happen? You're going to fall. You're going to fail. You will fall back into sin. You'll fall back into that sin you've been trying so hard to avoid. So choose obedience over offenses. Number three, choose eternal life over earthly liberty. Here's another one. They're, they're, these are all kind of very similar, but see, we as individuals, we think that we have to look out for number one, right? That, that liberty, that, that freedom, God, you don't get to tell me what to do in that area. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do some of that stuff, but God, you don't get to have full control of my life. That just doesn't work. And, and so when we try to gain our own freedom and liberty, it's just crash and burn every time. And such the better choice is eternal life. Hey, God, I am fully yours. You fully gave yourself to me by hanging on a cross and dying for me. And just my sin would have hung you to the cross. So, God, I will choose eternal life over earthly liberty. And the last one, choose accountability over affirmation. Some of you, I'll just say it lightly, you need new friends, all right? You need some different people in your life that are willing to speak truth into your life, God's truth, not affirm the junk and the sin that you are wrapped up in. You need people in your life that are willing to get into some uncomfortable spaces and say, hey, listen, I've just, I've got to tell you. I've been noticing some things about you recently and I, 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 I know God wants better for you. And not in a judgy, judgmental way, but just a loving way. And guess what? We need to do that with others. And again, with, with as much grace, humility, and love as we could possibly muster. And we need to speak that into people's lives. So we need to choose accountability over affirmation over having people in our lives that are just going to accept whatever junk we've been living in. I don't, I don't know where this is landing with you today. I can tell you it's, it's, it's landing in me. I, I'm in the middle of preaching going, oh, I need to change this. I've got to do this. I, I, it's, chances are probably prayerfully the Holy Spirit is working on you right now saying, hey, there's some things that you need to change in your life. That's what we want. That's why we open these doors for life change. Not so that we can just have another surface, not so just that we can have a little crew to hang out with, so that we will see true life change here. So would you stand with us? I'm going to pray. And then after we pray, the band is going to sing and just kind of lead us out. And, and while we're singing, if God has just worked on your heart this morning, if, if there's something that you, you just need to get off your chest, you need to confess, you need to come up and pray, you need somebody to pray over you, you want to talk to somebody about your relationship with Jesus, please come forward. We would love to talk with you. We would love to walk with you through that journey, whatever that journey is. So let's pray. God, we just come before you this morning. You are so good. God, you are the loving Savior, but God, you also are the convictor of hearts. So right now in this moment, God, convict our hearts. Speak to us in a way that only you can, God. Show us, shine a spotlight on the areas of our lives that we need to change. God, do something awesome in this time. God, help us to trust you with everything. God, help us to not stiff arm you out of just different areas of our lives, but God, help us to give you full access. Right now in this moment, God, if there are people that just don't have you as their Savior, right now would they say, Jesus, I need you. I need the Savior. I choose the Savior over my sin. 
So God, do something awesome this morning. Work in our hearts as only you can. We pray all of this in the awesome, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. If you need, please come forward. We'll pray with you.